Welcome to Represent NYC on the Manhattan Neighborhood Network. Thank you for joining us once again. I'm New York State Controller Tom DiNapoli. With COVID-19 vac vaccines available to many New Yorkers and a new federal stimulus and relief package on its way to approval, we finally see some light at the end of this tunnel that we've all been in. But the pandemic's impact will be felt for years to come. Uh, my office has been looking at parts of New York City's economy that have suffered the most. We put out reports on the impact on the restaurant industry, on the retail sector, and most recently on the arts and entertainment sector. So today on Represent NYC, among the range of topics, we're going to discuss what arts and entertainment mean to New York City's economy, its jobs, and its identity. So my first guest is Senator Jose Serrano. Senator Serrano is a dynamic force for his constituents of the South and West Bronx, East Harlem, Upper Yorkville, Roosevelt Island, and the Upper West Side. He is from my point of view, one of our greatest uh, state senators, a hard worker, very thoughtful. He chairs the Senate Majority Conference and he also is chair of the Committee on Cultural Affairs, Tourism, Parks and Recreation. Distinguished service in Albany, mem former member of the New York City Council. Senator Serrano, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much, Controller DiNapoli. It's really such a pleasure to be here with you and, and uh, I thank you for all your great work and and friendship over the years. Thank you for what you do. Oh, it's a pleasure. And look, you, you, you've been an advocate for the arts and culture uh, for a long time, you know, budget battles, parks as well. Uh, and, and as you know, and you know, I appreciated your support of our efforts, we put out uh, this, this report on what's been happening with arts, entertainment, recreation in New York City. And, you know, to think that when, when COVID hit, you know, within two months, 66% of the jobs were lost in this sector. They haven't come back yet. You know, just share with us your perspective, you know, from what you see very close at hand, both from the perspective of, of being a resident of, you know, of the city, but also where you sit, you know, leading the efforts in the Senate. Ha, ha, what's your sense about where we're at? How are we gonna get back to where we need to be? Well, it's, it's, a, it's really an important question and a really tough topic when you consider how closely tied uh, the economy of New York City and the state is to the arts and culture and tourism, the cultural tourism that it brings in. So um, as we know, uh, the arts and culture are a major driving force to so many different other sectors. Um, and and we, we see so many examples of how they have been able to do that. We think back to 9-11 after the tra tragedy of 9-11 in New York City was in many ways brought to its knees, um, but it was the arts and the cultural sector that helped us to recover from that, not only economically, but emotionally. Um, and it did bring, uh, it sort of created a sense to tourists from all over the world that, hey, it's safe to come back. Um, now we have a much more prolonged shutdown because of the pandemic, and it's had a very devastating effect. And as your report showed, you know, these, uh, these institutions and organizations were the first to close and will be the last to reopen. Uh, a lot of these tremendous jobs and careers uh, of all levels within the arts, not just performers, but the set designers and carpenters and lighting designers and dramaturgs and, you know, so many different careers have had to be put on hold. So this is a real talent drain. We've lost so many great artists um, in our community. So the question is, how do we get the arts from where we are now to brighter days in the future without them completely collapsing and thereby uh, making our recovery that much longer and harder? So I think it's really uh, important, um, your report sort of um, it goes beyond just sort of outlining the problem, which we all know what's there, but sort of putting the numbers behind it. And I think it gives us a little bit of a guide uh, to see how recovery can, uh, we could do more to help them as we move forward with recovery. I mean, sort of the federal aid thus far has been helpful, especially with unemployment insurance for folks who've been out of work. And in the new package, there's about $270 million in grants for arts and humanities organizations, hopefully, uh, much of that could be targeted to New York. But, you know, also, uh, you, you know better than me, uh, Yankee Stadium and the small businesses tied to 
yeah. you know, the recreation uh, and sports sector as well. I mean, you know, it's very hard to quantify the impact on small business of the pandemic. And, you know, to your earlier point, how arts and, and recreation and uh, including the parks, not just uh, the sporting uh, venues, how that's tied to bringing people to the city, whether those are people from that live outside the city, foreign tourism, overseas tourism, which obviously is, is going to be delayed for a period of time. But it's that whole ecosystem in the city and the city's identity is so tied to this sector. How are you, how are you seeing the small businesses? I mean, let's just take as an example, you know, the Yankee Stadium area. How, how have they been holding up through all this? Well, that, that's a great question. And I live in the neighborhood of Yankee Stadium, only three blocks away. And I've seen what a devastating effect it's had on the small businesses that uh, are so closely tied to fans coming to actual games. Um, and uh, the, it's been very devastating. I think um, they've lost uh, close to 90% of their business uh, because of no, no fans. Uh, there's a bit of, light, uh, a bit of uh, light at the end of the tunnel in that we foresee uh, some improvements in the summer, maybe on a very limited capacity. But it's important to note that whether it be the Yankee Stadium corridor or shows on Broadway or off Broadway, um, that in, unless they're sort of operating at a, at a close to high capacity or full capacity, um, their economic model may not entirely work. So I, while it is you know, encouraging to know that we're hopefully getting to a better place where we can start seeing more live performances and live sporting events, we're certainly not there. Um, and the effect that this has had on my neighborhood where I live has been pretty far reaching. And it's important that we try to do all that we can for some of these businesses, many of which are historic um, sort of Yankee souvenir shops have been around forever, mm. um, that they can at least make it through to the other side. Because I think once we get there, we'll start to see an increase over time. But, but just on an earlier point that, that we were discussing, uh, especially as it, as it goes to some of the off-Broadway theaters and some of the smaller arts venues, a lot of them were operating sort of right there at the, at the threshold of, of making it or not making it. And, uh, and this was before the pandemic and this was in the best of times. So you could imagine how that has had such a negative effect. They weren't doing spectacularly well financially prior to the pandemic. And I think it begs the question um, to going forward as we try to reimagine all things and take this as an opportunity to look at the budgets and look at how we fund things in the budget and think about the arts and culture as less of something that, you know, it's cool if we can afford to do it, but not the end of the world if we can't support them. And look at them more as a pillar within our society, because as you know, the arts are really a good vehicle for social justice, a really important educational tool, much more than aesthetic or entertainment, but it really is the voice of the people. And I think it's one, it's, it shouldn't be lost in this discussion that maybe we should find ways to create even more stability within that industry. Well said, especially those smaller venues. And when we announced the report, we had some uh, folks who work in, whether it's museums or, or shows, they're real gems and they have so much to do with neighborhood identity, uh, quality of life, and, 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 per, and certainly providing jobs. I mean, you know, I, I think you're absolutely right. And so we've got to do the reopening uh, safely, you know, based on, on the health. Uh, you re represent a lot of neighborhoods that have been very heavily impacted by the pandemic. Are people getting access to the vaccine in a way that um, you've seen progress in that regard? Been a lot of criticism about not just the supply, but you know the, the ability to access at a convenient location of the vaccine. Give us an update what you're seeing in, in, in the communities you represent in that regard. Well, um, as you know, health disparities has been something that has plagued communities like the South Bronx and East Harlem long before the pandemic began. Uh, and these uh, disparities have uh, created a situation now with the, the pandemic that it, it's just exploded into a major health crisis. And we saw that with some of the highest infection rates in our community um, and some of the highest, unfortunately, death rates. And um, as we move forward, I think it's important that we start to root out or look at the root causes of these health disparities in our community because the next pandemic will be here at some point in the future. I hate to say it, but it is a, it is a, a, a reality that we should be prepared for. And looking at all the root causes and a lot of that has to do with 
the economic and social impacts within our community, uh, inadequate housing, inadequate access to quality health care, um, food insecurity, housing insecurity, all of those overlays, I think, have created this unfortunate perfect storm of this pandemic having a disproportionate impact of com on communities of color. So moving forward, as we try to recover from this pandemic, um, my colleagues and, and, and we've been all working together to try to make sure that individuals in dealing with food insecurity are able to get food, PPE, different things to help get through. But now that we're looking at vaccinations, yes, there are major impediments to getting vaccines because of the supply. Um, you know, I think as supply ramps up, I think we'll start to see a greater number of individuals in our community getting vaccinated. I think some of the tech issues having to do a lot of this stuff online is an impediment for some of our seniors um, who, who may not have computers at home, who may not be as tech savvy. And I think those are issues that need to be continuously addressed. But, but I do believe that, you know, with the Yankee Stadium site, the vaccination site being dedicated to Bronx residents, I think that's a brilliant idea. And I think you're sort of hitting, targeting an, an area of most need. Um, and I think that model can be replicated in other communities that suffer from health disparities, that are at higher risk of complications from COVID. And I think moving forward, we'll start to see things improving. But again, it takes a comprehensive approach in looking at the data and looking at sort of the legacy, the unfortunate legacy of health disparities in our community and how that plays in. All important concerns that you're identifying and, you know, just have a couple of minutes left, but it really does tail, dovetails into what you're working on right now, which is getting the state budget done. And, uh, you know, fortunately the revenue numbers are becoming a, a little better. As you know, the revenue uh, consensus forecast added you know, uh, two and a half billion dollars more to what have been projected. In terms of your priorities, obviously we've touched on some of them, uh, education, housing, there are a lot of other ones, but, you know, just give us a sense as, as you're looking to close down the budget uh, by April 1st, thereabouts, hopefully by April 1st, what would be your priorities that you're advocating for for your district? Well, I think rent relief is a big part of it, both on the residential side and on the commercial side, because I think a lot of the Small businesses were probably not doing too well even before the pandemic. And uh, I think the debt that many of them may be in now because of rent, it begs the question, how do we ensure that they're able to continue to do what they need to do? How do, how do we ensure that residents uh, that are um, uh, living in poverty or are, are not wealthy, how can they remain in their homes? Uh, these are issues that are of critical importance as we shape the budget. So looking at who are the most vulnerable in our society and ensuring that we create a strong safety net for them is uh, my utmost priority. Um, so those are important issues as well. And as I mentioned a minute ago, um, health disparities. I think this is as great an opportunity as ever to look at the root causes of health disparities and how that has played into COVID and what are the economic impacts of those health disparities on communities of color. And then another thing that I'm, I'm really eager to continue to do is to further connect urban communities with nature and parks. Uh, as a kid growing up in the 70s, we really didn't have a lot of uh, access to the outdoors. And I'm trying to get more and more people to understand that there are uh, so many wonderful benefits that comes from engagement, not just hiking up in the Adirondacks, because that's kind of a long distance for folks in the city to travel. But you know, Van Cortland Park, Central Park, we have some of the most amazing urban forests uh, of any city uh, in the nation and connecting people more to green spaces and enhancing green space in our communities. I think you'll see a reduction on asthma rates and other health disparities, as well as bringing about better mental well-being. So I think connecting nature is one of those things that we like the arts. We need to look at them less as, you know, kind of cool if we could do it, but it's okay if we can't. No, this is actually critically important to the economy and well-being of our of our community. Yeah, well, well said. Thank you, Senator. We're unfortunately out of time. We'll have to have the conversation once again. But thank you for your advocacy. It benefits not only residents of your district in Manhattan and the Bronx, but really all people of New York State. And I know, especially now that you're in the majority, you can get even more done. And we are all thankful for that. On a personal note. 
give your dad my best. I had the privilege to serve with your dad when he was in the state assembly and he, he did such great work in the House of Representatives as well. And you are carrying on a wonderful family tradition and just stay well and keep doing your great work. Thank you so much. I will tell him he'll be so happy and thank you for all that you're doing. Great, great. Thanks, Senator. <laughs> uh, great conversation. And uh, now we have uh, another uh, wonderful guest. Uh, it's really a pleasure to continue the conversation on the arts and, and other key issues as well uh, with the incredible, dynamic, hardworking Manhattan Borough President, the Honorable Gail Brewer. She certainly needs no introduction to represent NYC viewers. She's a regular, regular on the channel. She has done so much, uh, certainly in the city council, many other public service uh, careers before that, and most recently as Manhattan Borough President to shape a better future, not just for Manhattan, but for all of New York City. So Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, I appreciate that you joined us when we released our uh, report on arts, entertainment, and recreation uh, in New York City. And it was wonderful to have you on uh, our Zoom presentation and announcement because Manhattan uh, really is the epicenter of uh, arts and culture in New York City and you, have worked so closely with so many of the venues and establishments over the years. You've seen firsthand, you know, the damage when we talk about the loss of, you know, two thirds of the jobs in this sector, you've seen it up close. Why don't you just share with us, as you did when we released the report, your perspective on, on where we are and, and, and now that we're doing some initial steps to reopen, how, how do you see that going at this point? Well, first of all, thank you uh, for that report. I think we all feel those on the call and certainly the public that such a report hasn't been done in a very long time. And it's incredibly important to constantly point out that we love the arts, but they produce economic development as much as we love them. And they are, it's a combination that's win-win and it must come back. So within the uh, borough of Manhattan, I believe that totally in Broadway and the arts in general, it's around almost 94,000 jobs. And, and in the borough of Manhattan alone, 70,000 people work in this industry of arts and 50,000 of them, you know, just those in that sector working, uh, live in Manhattan and 4,400 businesses within this are based here. I don't know exactly how this fits in, but don't forget nightlife because nightlife does include arts and entertainment. $35 billion industry. And, and the reason I think it's particularly important, and this is just a supposition, is that we're having a lot of challenges in the neighborhood with you know, guns and shootings and so on. I really think it's because a lot of these jobs that take place in the nightlife world are not available now. Mm. And that's another challenge that doesn't uh, pop up. The other reason to have this industry come back is just the hotels and the restaurants. Let me give you a restaurant situation. Sure. Right now in Midtown, all the restaurants are closed. All of them are closed. And I've been getting calls because they are sometimes, you know, large and small. They were able to get some federal PPP at the beginning, but they haven't been able to open because there is nobody there. There's nobody in the hotel and there's nobody on Broadway. And now the problem is if you don't spend your PPP, you can lose it. In some cases, it's $5 million a restaurant. So wow. we're working hard to try to get the federal government to allow them to spend it when they open. They'll spend it for the right reasons, the employees. But, um, and then of course, with the hotels in New York City, you have around 700 hotels. That's what we have. Maybe 170 are occupied either by some few tourists or mostly city individuals who are homeless or city individuals who have COVID, but that's not many. And then of course, you just have the tourism industry. Tourists don't come to see you. They don't come to see me. They come for the museums and Broadway and they come for the excitement of New York. And, and when I say Broadway, I also mean the smaller uh, venues. But the reason is when you have 65 million tourists and you have almost none here, they will not come until Broadway's open. They love the shows. Um, and then of course, when I talk about entertainment, I wanna mention that all during the pandemic, we in Manhattan have held two, every two weeks, phone calls with the uptown venues, the small theaters, all the way to the Apollo. 
And that's hard. I mean, they are really struggling because they don't have anything but a Zoom to produce. But they too participate in this amazing entertainment industry. And then of course, you also just have the, what I call recreation. You got the small yoga studios, you got the places where people get their ability to be flexible, the dance studios, you know, all of those are part of this amazing industry. And so, you know, I understand the governor pushing to have, and this is important, the sports arenas with a QR open. But I also want to thank the Broadway League because they have tried really hard working with doctors from Mount Sinai, working with the best health professionals, trying to think of how do you go on stage? How do you have an audience? Because it's tighter than sports. And so, you know, these are the issues that I know they're um, facing. And it is, you know, really the industry, in addition to finance, in addition to tech, but this is what brings New York, especially those who are um, in the arts, is why people come to New York, why we live here yep. <laughs> in some cases. And what the other issue we're concerned about, which I hear about all the time from the unions, is that um, people are leaving. In other words, if you can get a job, I hate to say in St. Louis, or you can get a job in an orchestra in LA, you might go. And you can't get a second violinist as great as the one who has just left. Yeah. You know, you really have to have that talent that has developed over time. Now, it's great that the governor and the mayor have, you know, in the streets, we have to be sure that those artists, be they, you know, uh, visual, musicians, dancer, theater, that they're pay paid appropriately. That's another issue because yep. there is a concern that we have all this arts in the street, but those people need to be paid and yep. paid appropriately. I mean, you really have pointed out so eloquently the connection between the arts, entertainment, recreation, cultural organizations, with the restaurant sector, with the small businesses, I mean, with tourism, both within you know New York and around from around the country and around the globe. It's all tied together. And, and of course it's jobs, uh, it's, it's many cases entrepreneurs, uh, it's tax revenue for the city and the state, it's all interconnected. And I know you've been a very uh, outspoken advocate when you've seen bureaucracy get in the way of uh, smart policy and practices. You know, one of the things we talked about on the call with the report is the need for, as we're trying to reopen, the city and the state to coordinate and not have uh, these establishments get caught, you know, in the crosshairs of, of, of conflicting information. Are you seeing, you know, either in terms of reopening or certainly getting the vaccine out, are you seeing a more smooth implementation of, of state and city policy or, or are there still some bumps in the road we've got to work on? Well, there's still, I mean, there's a vaccine for everybody. There certainly are bumps in the road, it's improving. It's improving also because there may be more supply because obviously that will help. But right now in the borough of Manhattan, um, there is still a state uh, process with a website and a call center. Uh, the city now, instead of having two uh, websites has one. And then of course, some of the individual providers have their own and the VA has their own. And now FEMA to their credit has started uh, having some sites. Uh, NYCHA has some sites, which are sometimes run by the state and sometimes run by the city. And then churches and synagogues, sometimes they have a state site, sometimes they have a city site. The good news in all of this is that we have started having community-based organizations, whether it's a city or state site, be the uh, conductor, so to speak. In other words, a community-based organization, like I know C. Virginia Fields has a wonderful health, Black health nonprofit that she runs. So she has been given, I'm making this up, you know, 200 slots for vaccines, and then she will get the individuals from the neighborhood who are either older or who have underlying conditions. They then definitely have a uh, shot. It's not, oh my goodness, I've been on the state site, and then I've been on the city site, and I can't get anything. So we've been trying to do this partnership, and that works ultimately so much better. Um, now, in terms of the uh, you know, entertainment world, however, you know, you have, as, um, you know, the Broadway League points out, it, it's, it's very hard on stage. You're very close to each other. You know, you love the opera, I know. You know, you know, my husband loves the opera. 
But what I'm saying is stage has a lot of, uh, you know, talking and there's a lot of uh, saliva. So you have to be really careful. This is not uh, figured out yet. It's also Women's History Month. And uh, you, you created your own history as a fighter for women's rights and opportunity. And in your career, uh, you've worked with some very important uh, uh, women leaders, starting with our mutual uh, friend who we admire so much, our, our first woman elected statewide, Lieutenant Governor Marianne Krupsack. Uh, give us your perspective on when we talk about women's history, uh, what's your perspective on where we've been, where do we need to go, and how about doing that in a minute? <laughs> I can do it quickly. We're very happy during the pandemic, even we got the women's suffragist statue up in Central Park. That was oh, a yes. big deal. Big that deal. was a big deal. And it's very popular and lots of people go to see it. The, pe the pandemic has hurt women um, in all the media because people have to be home to care for kids who are uh, virtually going to school. And so we have to figure out uh, in 2022 what it is that we do to support massive childcare. Uh, figuring out that their women can return to work in a way that makes sense for their family. This pandemic has unearthed so many different challenges uh, for the communities of color, for essential workers, but interestingly enough, all the gains that women have made in terms of the workforce have been set back mm -hmm. by this pandemic, and it's because of childcare. So we have to figure out how education fits into this so that women can return to work if they want to, and in a way that makes sense for their family. That is a question mark right now. But I, you know, I try to get women elected to office. I, I'm on Eleanor's legacy board. I was one of the heads of the National Women's Political Caucus. And I think we have a ways to go, but this is unearthed something that we have to work at very carefully. Yeah, and I, I think you touched on it. And as you may recall, my predecessor in the state assembly, uh, it was an intimidating honor to follow her, was uh, May Newberger. And one of the things May first taught me, she said, Tom, you can talk about women's issues, but ultimately, wh whatever you're talking about, uh, employment opportunity, child care, go down the list, these ultimately are family issues. And, and a family is impacted when we don't address these concerns. So just you know, thank you for being a tireless advocate on all of these issues. And I know providing such incredible practical help to your constituents in Manhattan, you are everywhere, even when it has to be by Zoom and virtual, you still keep an incredible schedule. And I know when folks in Manhattan don't know where else to turn, they turn to Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer <laughs> because you are a fighter and you get results. So thank you, Gail. And we'll have you on again for another conversation, but uh, we're just about uh, out of time. Thanks again to uh, both of our guests, State Senator Jose Serrano and Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer. I'm State Controller Tom DiNapoli. I thank all of you for watching Represent NYC on Manhattan Neighborhood Network. Stay safe and stay well. Mm -hmm.